against further consideration of the committee substitute required by statute to give medic a Medicaid contract to certain managed care companies, even if HHSC believes the managed care company is not qualified to take care of the designated population. Members, we are talking about our most vulnerable Texans and our most expensive state contracts. Who are these mandatory contracts given to? They are given to managed care companies owned by a hospital in a hospital district that currently includes El Paso County, Harris County, Bayer County, Dallas County, and up until they went bankrupt, Travis County. Although I would point out that Sendero, located in Travis County, even though they are bankrupt, under current law, is still eligible to submit an RFP for a contract, and if they did, HHSC would be bound and uh, required to give them a contract. All other plans in Texas have to compete for the remaining contracts. That includes many of the plans in your districts, members. Plans like Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor Scott & White, Dell Children's, Driscoll of Nueces County, and Cook Children's of Tarrant. They get the leftovers. In 2019, the managed care company owned and operated by the Harris County Hospital District, which is run by Harris County Commissioner's Court, was not awarded a contract in Medicaid because HHSC did not believe they could successfully manage the population. And I quote, CHC ranked last out of 10 proposals submitted for Harris service area. HHSC determined that CHC did not provide the best value for the agency. Based on CHC's evaluation scores, oral presentation, HHSC determined that other respondents would be better able to fulfill the long-term obligations of providing acute and long-term care recipients or care services to Medicaid recipients in Houston area and Jefferson County service area who are blind, disabled, and older than 65. CHC's bid proposal and oral presentation failed to meet Section 533.004B's uh, requirement of demonstrable re performance. However, Community Health Choice of Harris County sued over this determination and argued that the court to the court that it did not matter how they performed in the procurement process. They insisted that HHSC must offer them a Medicaid contract due to the mandatory statute that I mentioned a moment ago, which is the only subject of this bill. Commissioner Young said in her appeal of the decision, this deprives the commissioner not only of the discretion, but the duty entrusted to her by the legislature necessary to protect the health and welfare of disabled and senior Texas citizens from unqualified and incompetent MCOs. And those are her words, by the way, not mine. As evident from the plain text of the statute, this was ultimately not the legislature's intent. However, ultimately, the court sided with community health choice of Harris County against the state of Texas, citing this very mandatory statute that we seek to repeal today. This decision meant that moving forward, as long as this statute remains on the books, the state must contract with the four mandatory plans regardless of how poorly they perform or how low they score in a procurement process. So, committee substitute of, of House Bill, I'm sorry, House Bill 2401 repeals the statutory requirement that HHSC award mandatory contracts in Medicaid so that everyone competes on a level playing field and it instructs HHSC to award contracts that have not yet reached the operational start date according to the scores achieved during a normal procurement process that complied with state law before the court ruling. By doing this, we are ensuring that only the most qualified managed care plans are serving our most vulnerable populations. Members, I'm going to say one other thing and then I'm, I'm happy to take questions. And that is, well, actually, I'm going to say two things. Number one, this bill does not require or does not repeal the requirement. If you look at the first page of the bill, it still states that HHSC must consider not and shall consider preference for organizations that are based in a community, organizations that provide indigent care, that are affiliated with local provider groups. So all of the things that folks are worried about, about suddenly not having 
a care program in their, their community or the hospital in my community might be in jeopardy if I'm one of these four things. HHSC is still required, even if this bill passes under statute, to consider all of those factors in their decision to make an award. So none of that changes. The second thing I want to point out is with respect to, with respect to some of the, the contracts that are in process right now. There are legitimate concerns that we heard in committee, in, in Chairman Frank's committee, that were brought by disability rights advocates who are deeply troubled by the current procurement process and the fact that they are worried that their uh, stakeholders, that, that disabled Texans, older Texans with disabilities, may be relegated to a health plan that HHSC has determined is not capable of performing the duties required of the health plan in order to execute this contract. And, and I would submit to you that if you look at the witness list, there was not a single disability rights group that testified against this bill. Rather, they are all for this bill because they are truly scared about the future of their health care, and they are crying out to you today to take a step to protect them. And with that, I'm happy to yield to my colleague. Mr. Martinez, for Fisher, for purpose. Mr. Speaker, will the gentleman yield for the gentleman questions? Yield for questions? Of course. The gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Chairman Oliverson. I, I appreciate it. Uh, I know things were really busy last night and fast, and uh, I intended to ask you these questions yesterday, so thank you for yielding. I, I, I'm just concerned uh, the university health system, healthcare providers that I represent in Bear County, uh, particularly they provide the service for Bear County, but in specific, they are also located in the district that I represent. And, and there is some extreme concern about existing procurements that have already made it through a process and they're awaiting final signatures. And so there, there seems to be an element of retroactivity. And, and that's where my concern is coming from. And I'm sure you have not heard that for the first time is, sure. can, can you give me a, a, an answer, or your perspective on how this is not retroactive? Because it seems to me that it is. Yes, no, I, and I'm, I appreciate your question, and I think that, that bears explanation. And so we've defined retroactivity as operational start date. And so, and that is the operative term, no pun intended, in, in this bill, um, that essentially if a contract has already moved forward and people are enrolled in care is being delivered, then we believe that should not be disrupted. We do not want to do anything to disrupt care that is ongoing or networks that are already in place in order to provide that care to Texans who rely on the Medicaid managed care system for their health care. That being said, as you may aware, be aware, there is one standard procurement process for HHSC that applies regardless of which program you're going through. And until such day time as that you have achieved operational start date, that contract has not gone forward into the operational phase. So it is still in that award phase. So the change I think you're talking about and the nuance here is that there are certain contracts, the one that I mentioned, for example, that although they haven't gone into full operational status yet, there have been tentative uh, contracts where they said, you're in, you're in, you're out, you're out, you're out. Right. And, and, and what we're saying is, is that had it not been for this statute right here, HHSC takes everybody's contract that applies, and they go through a very comprehensive written and oral examination of the applicants to rank them sure. in an attempt to provide the best level of managed care and, for Texans. And no. so you, you have a ranking already, right? Yes, and so from first to last, you know, just like we run a race, right? Somebody finishes first, somebody finishes last. And so all this would say is essentially we want to use those rankings. We well, don't here, want to artificially put our thumb on the scale. And, and here's my concern. I mean, you, you, you've hit the nail on the head about the, you know, continuity of care and the continuum of care. You have providers that have gone from the procurement process to where signatures have been executed and we're just waiting on operating and under this bill, if it passes, they, they did everything they were supposed to do. They just not have not started. And if they don't start by September 1, rather than being able to go forward, they have to come all the way back. And, and maybe that's fair on a procurement, from a procurement perspective. What happens to the care, like in the, in, in the Star Plus program for elderly and disabled, 
Uh, it, it seems to me that if you've gone through the process and the law changes while you're in the process, the law can change in a forward sense, but it should not impact those, in this instance, I believe two contracts that have gone through the process are just waiting to get final signatures so that they can operate. I mean, and can't we accomplish that in this piece of legislation? Well, Representative, I think the issue is twofold. Number one, what we're talking about here, and, but it's an important difference, and so I'm glad we're discussing this, is I think there's a, a bright line between contracts that are operational and contracts that are not yet operational. If a contract is not yet operational and those lives are not currently being covered and that care is not currently being delivered, I believe it's a decision for the body, but I believe we have a responsibility to make sure that those contracts, when they get fully executed and they're operational, that the level of care that's being provided is the best care that can be provided. Now, you mentioned the Star Plus. Those are the groups that are crying out to us right now that they're unhappy and they're concerned and they're worried about the future of their health care, not because HHSC did anything uh, out of the ordinary in terms of ranking. They, they ranked these applications from first to last in terms of highest quality to lowest quality. But then after the fact, retroactively, they changed the scale because of this one piece of, of of, of legislation is one piece of law that basically tells HHSC you have to go against your better judgment and you have to do this one thing even though it may harm people in Texas. And so that's kind of where I draw the line. Well, I hope that I, answers your question. And I, it, it does, but I, I appreciate it. You know, and, and you know, the care that's being provided, and I understand that, that you know, there's going to be some great outcomes, there's going to be some people not happy, there's going to be people who have to wait for appointments, and that's just really another function and derivative of an MCO program that just can't open the door to everybody at the same time and provide excellent care. I mean, it, it takes a process, but even in the, in, in the STAR program for children and pregnant women, I mean, we're talking about multi-billion dollar procurements where there has been sure. a process, everybody did exactly what they needed to do, and, and absent this proposal, you know, things would continue to go forward. And there, there's nothing in the legislation, the, the word you and I like to joke about, there are no guardrails, my friend. <laughs> there are no guardrails that say, hey, we understand that there are things that already occurred and, and we can't undo that. We can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. So we're gonna, we're gonna set that as our baseline going forward, new procurements, new rules, existing procurements, existing rules, and not have people suffer for the lack of access to care because they've signed and inked up an agreement, but they haven't gone through all the final procedures to be fully operational. I think, I think it's the operational term that's a little bit too aggressive. I, I would say if you don't have a deal inked up by September 1, then you're out, you start all over. But if you're inked out and you're just trying to, to, to perfect and get into the operational phase, you should be held harmless. And I, I, would, I would hopefully consider that you would consider letting us add some language to protect that rather than have a fight over this bill that you know one of us is going to win and one of us is lose. I'd like, I'd like for both of us to win in this instance. Would you consider that? I, I'm afraid I, I won't, and, but I respect you. I, 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 my belief is that, uh, that operational start date is an appropriate determination considering the fact that we're not asking them to go back and do the, do the whole process all over again. There was a ranking, and everybody knows where they ranked. But there are some that were given a get-out-of-jail-free card, and they were able to basically ignore their ranking and place higher than they would have otherwise placed. And the result of that is that more highly qualified applicants were pushed out of the procurement in favor of lower qualified applicants. So the thing that, that concerns me, and I'm just being honest with you, it, the, thing, the reason I'm, I'm sort of fixated on where I am on this is that at the end of the day, these are our most vulnerable people. And I want the best quality health care I can get for them. I don't want them getting second-class health care from the last, you know, the lowest performing provider in the state. I want them to get the best. And so, you know, I want to move forward knowing that every procurement that's not currently operational, that the top five or the top six or the top seven, that that's the best health care we can push out there to these programs to serve these disabled individuals, these these small children that need our help, these children with complex medical, whatever the procurement is, I want them to get the best. I don't want them to get the last. They don't deserve last place. Ms. Rose, for what purpose? 
Mr. Speaker, does the gentleman yield for some questions? Will the gentleman yield for questions? Of course. The gentleman yields. Thank you, Dr. Oliverson. Um, when you opened up your remarks, you made the comment about, um, about the people who utilize the services at the hospitals and the mandatory, but do you realize that when, do you realize why they became mandatory contracts? Well, I know that they're affiliated with, with, uh, with charity care type healthcare systems in large urban counties. Oh. And is so that, is you, that what you're? Yes. Yeah, okay. And do you realize um, the people who um, you're working with with this bill, at the time, were they willing to take on these patients? I, I can't speak to what the marketplace looked like in 97, Representative, but what I can tell you is that moving forward, I think there was a concern in 97, but as we're now in 2023, I don't think anybody could object look at the Medicaid managed care system and say that there's not a strong willingness for competition, for improvements in quality of care, and for best value, best quality care, that there are people willing to fight tooth and nail to prove that they can do it better, and I just want them to be able to. Well, I hear what you're saying, but if there was a time where there were people where not some of these facilities did not want to take on these indigent patients, and then now... To me, now that Medicaid rates, rates are going up. I know, but they can't be. Does you and Mr. Toad sorry. going to have a dialogue? No, I'm okay. sorry, Representative. Mr. Toad, thank you. So, <laughs> <laughs> I should say excuse you. It, but at that time, no one would want to take on these patients. And I think it's just unfair that now that they've been doing the work all of these years, and now that the Medicaid rates are up higher, now everybody's want to come join on the bandwagon, but when there was an opportunity to just care for people because they needed the care, that was not the case. I understand where you're coming from, but I'll tell you from my perspective what I think is unfair, and that is that the current system that we have means that there are a handful of participants in a procurement process that have no incentive to improve on quality or their delivery model because they're guaranteed to win anyway. It doesn't, they show up with a full house every time they play cards and, and it doesn't matter. So, so what I care about and what I want and what I believe going forward is that Medicaid managed care works and that competition works and that if we just let these plans compete in your home community of Dallas, you have one of these plans, they're a high performing plan. They would win contracts. They don't need a mandatory contract to win. But let them compete. Let them be incentivized to compete. Because at the end of the day, people in my community and your community are depending on the highest quality of service we can deliver. And we're not getting that when we're giving people participation well, trophies. You know, and I understand that, you know, you, you, I guess when you keep talking about saying making the com compete, 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 we're talking about lives. And if people are yes. getting the appropriate care that, they're, that they need, and you keep hot, miss. Oh, okay. And you're making this about competition and health care when it should be about who's providing the best care for those patients. I want to talk to you a little bit about the certification. So do you agree that according to the 2021 law that you sponsored last year, last legislative session in Senate Bill 1244, which was the hospital district MCOs must be certified by HHSC as financially and operational capable of performing under the Medicaid contract? Gentlemen's time's expired. Mr. Speaker, Ms. I Rose, for to, purpose. I, could we extend the gentleman's time, please? Is there objection to extending the gentleman's time? Hearing none, the gentleman's time's extended. Yes, yes, Representative, I'm I'm aware, but I I am also aware uh, because my staff was actually watching the proceeding live as it played out that one of the managed care I'm the, I'm sorry the mandatory contractors came into a deposition for an ongoing uh, legal action and said under, under oath in a deposition that this chapter of code precludes that law from applying to them. Okay, but so they the don't think they belong, they don't think they have it. This, uh, the law we passed to them is meaningless. <laughs> but didn't, they, didn't the, didn't the uh, hospital district support your bill? Did, and really agree to the certification requirements in your bill? 
I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't understand the question. I apologize. We were talking about... No, he can, he can hear me. He just didn't understand. No, I, I didn't understand. I'm sorry. I wasn't... I, I can was hear just you. saying, though, but last year, in that Senate Bill 1244, didn't the hospital district support your bill, right? I, honestly, I, I can't remember, Representative. They may have. I, I just know for a fact that they've said more recently in, in recorded legal proceedings that they don't believe it applies to them. Okay, well, let me go to this. The other day, I believe it was this Wednesday, so on Monday, there was a conversation between you and Representative I, uh, Allison on, regarding House Bill 2553 about you respecting the work of stakeholders. And I believe you said that whether the stakeholders, and I quote, sign the papers or not, this is about integrity and the body and the message it sends, quote. So it seems like the same sentiment will be applied here since you passed the bill last session requiring certification. You don't think it apply here as well? I, I don't. And this has been in place since 1997, so I mean, this is, been around a long time. It was a very different Medicaid managed care environment back then. I'm sorry, I, I don't. Okay. Well, let me ask you this question. So while the five national for-profit MCOs back in your bill keep referring to a mandatory contract, it is actually conditional in the way that it awards contingent on certification. Am I correct? I now, now I can't hear you. I apologize. I'm sorry. You I'm, mean to tell me you can? Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't now in I can the microphone. Hear you. I'm sorry. Sorry You're about right. that, Miss Tony. My apologies, Representative Alderson. I was saying while the five national for-profit MCOs back in your bill keep referring to mandatory contract, it is actually conditional in a way that it awards contingent on certification. That what? is, in fact, what your bill said last legislative session, but I forgot you just said you don't remember the bill, right? Yeah, and, it, and my understanding is that all of the plans have achieved a certification. So that, that's kind of a, yeah, I mean, that, that's not a very high bar. Okay, well, do you realize that all the hospital district NCOs that applied for the recent Star Plus procurement were, in fact, certified? So was everybody else. Hmm? Everybody else was, too. Everybody will certify? Yeah, that's why I say that's not a very high bar. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, move passage. Ms. Ortega, for what purpose? Will the gentleman yield for a few more questions? Will the gentleman yield for a question. Of course. All right. Uh, Representative, does your, does your bill do anything to address the actual performance in the Texas Medicaid system? Well, it does in a way, if you think about it, because if all health plans knew that they had to compete in a future procurement based on past performance and based on their knowledge and ability to execute a contract, then yes, HHSC's hands would finally not be tied behind their back and they would be able to do for the first time since 97 what is in the best interest of all Medicaid beneficiaries and that is pick the best plans to execute the contracts. So it's just not relying on the scoring of the RFP? Well, HHSC has testified in committee that there's a variety of factors that go into how they score the RFP. And I would submit to you that the vast majority of points are awarded based on what's called the oral examination, where they bring folks in and they ask complex questions about care delivery situations and they grade responses, sort of like me as a doctor I take a written exam, but then I have my oral boards, and my oral boards is basically there to see how I function under pressure, to see how I function in decision making, and to see how I would execute. And so yes, I think they have a very comprehensive mechanism through the RFB process for evaluating past and likely future performance. Okay, do you believe that a score on an RFP is more important or a better barometer for performing healthcare services than how an MCO actually performs in the field? I'm going to leave that decision up to HHSC because that's what they're charged with doing is finding the best healthcare plans for the Texans that we have told them that's your job. Okay. They depend on it. Um, according to HHSC's own data, are you aware that the four hospital districts on average performed 94.17% better 
on the comprehensive score for STAR than the average on the five national plans, the same plans that, are, that, that you're carrying this bill for? I'm not. I, I didn't um, have that statistic. I, just information that I, that I received. And I, okay. I mean, I've received a lot of information on this bill my ses this session myself, and a lot of it is directly contradictory to each other, so you end up oftentimes trying to figure out who's really telling the truth. No, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that this is one of those issues where people have said a lot of things, and they've okay. quoted a lot of data and a lot of statistics. Okay. One last question. Are you aware that HHH SC's recent Star Plus procurement did not give any weight in scoring as to how a MCO has performed in the past, but only focused on the answers on the RFP. I, I, I'm not aware. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bowers, for what purpose? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the gentleman yield for his question? Sure. The gentleman yields for a question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oliverson, and thank you for the conversation we had earlier yes, about this bill and um, about the legislation you're presenting. I just have a few questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you believe the justification for this bill that the hospital districts in some instance scored lower than their national plan counterparts on the RFPs? That's correct? I do. And I think that's pretty clearly documented that their scores were lower. Okay, well, wouldn't you agree that submitting an RFP and providing quality care in the field are two separate things? I'm going to leave that up to HHSC. It is their job to run the procurement. Okay. I just want to put, give them the opportunity to use their best judgment instead of having their hands tied behind their back. And you are aware that the national plans have entire departments that do nothing else but answer RFPs all over the country, aren't you? I'm not advised, Representative. I just know that, I mean, I guess you could make the argument that if they're, if they're that big and have that many people, they probably have a lot more people on the ground delivering care and, and dealing with claims and processing complex need situations. So... so you're aware that my father was a doctor here in the state of Texas almost 40 yes, years, and so I have great respect for the profession and what you do. But do you know these companies have sophisticated databases and tracking tools to calculate winning RFP responses? Are you aware of that? I'm not. And, and another thing, our, our local safety net hospitals, on the other hand, don't use your tax, local taxpayer dollars to keep professional grant writers on staff. Would you want them to use tax dollars for that purpose, Dr. Oliverson? Well, I think we've got to be careful to not conflate the hospital and the health plan, because although they are related, they're not the same thing. Okay, well, I wouldn't. And my last question is, do you think there is any subjectivity in how the RFPs are scored? No, not based on what I've seen and heard testimony from HHSC. I mean, this is what they do. This is what the state, this is, we charge them as a state agency to go out and find the best care providers and the best networks mm -hmm. that they can for these vulnerable Texans. And at the end of the day, we, you and I can have another conversation about if there's a way to do that better or if there's certain criteria they should be looking at or are they providing enough care not the subject of this bill. This bill just says nobody gets a participation trophy, nobody gets a third place award mm. for finishing dead last. That, that's not how we run races and that is sure as heck not how we should do Medicaid procurement. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, wanna, I would like to share an example with you to see if you're aware. El Paso's hospital district contracts with one of the major national plans to do their claims. In a recent procurement, the national plan scored the highest, and although it was the same claims process and the same actual people doing the work, the national plan employees, El Paso scored at the very bottom and very last. Don't you find it problematic that given the subjective nature of the RFP process that you think that should be the deciding factor when it comes to who should get these contracts? I don't believe that the RFP process is that subjective. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Moody, for what purpose? Will the gentleman yield for a couple of questions? Will the gentleman yield for yes, a couple more questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Oliverson. 
Um, I, this is something, obviously, I, I don't really wade into this arena of policy very often, except for the fact that we've got a plan in El Paso, and by all accounts, we've got a good plan in El Paso, and our community relies on it, and it's a trusted actor within our community. And so this, this would, you know, I, does have an impact in El Paso, and so respectfully just want to ask some questions about, um, about market share, uh, because in, in looking at how we're set up in this state, well, you would agree with me that a broader array of options, always better for the market, right? Monopoly is bad, broader Competition market is good, Representative. Com yes, okay. sir. So, so in, in the current market that we've got, our plans represent a little over... 10% of the market. So they're part of a mix. But in the national and other plans make up over 70% of the market today. Is that accurate? It, it could be representative. I'm not sure. But, but if I may, I, I would point out to you that there are actually more community-based plans that do not get the benefit of mandatory contracting like El Paso does, then there are plans that get the benefits. So when you talk about national plans and community plans, I think it's really important that we remember that the community plans is actually bifurcated between the four plans that are guaranteed a contract and the other plans like Driscoll in Nueces County and in the Valley and Cook Children's in Tarrant County and Texas, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Texas Children's in Houston that have to fight for every contract they get. They have to compete. So again, I don't want to make this about national plans versus community plans because that's not really the argument. Well, but I mean, we have community plans that earn every contract they get, except these four don't. But you would agree, man. There's, I mean, factually, according to HHSC, there's two plans that take up half of the half of the market share today in Texas. I think that HHSC, and I think where I know where you're going with this, I think HHSC should always encourage competition in the procurement process. We do not want to have a monopoly. And based on the number of people that submit RFPs to HHSC for procurements, I see no signs that that would, is even possibility at this point. Well, and I, I think, believe there's robust competition in the marketplace and I for know these an, contracts. And I, know, and I know a number of our a number of our plans are, are Im impacted, obviously, obviously out in, ours in El Paso is, is grabbed into this. And, and I don't think we've had the same issues as others. And so I want to, why, why if we, if in our processes, concerns haven't been raised for our community, for those folks that rely on that plan, why, why then are, are we grabbed into a bill that I think could, and I think you would disagree, but I think potentially could have negative fiscal implications for a plan that works well in our community? Well, and, and again, I, I don't want to Monday morning quarterback you on this, but I, I do think that I hear what you're saying, but I would, I would ask you to consider the possibility that HHSC is actually a thousand percent correct in how they score these RFPs. And by preserving this mechanism, this anachronistic mechanism going back to the mid-90s, you're actually denying the citizens of El Paso the highest quality Medicaid managed care that they could be getting. But, but we're doing well. But, okay. Our but plans are... So, don't so, you want their, your constituents to have so the best quality care they can get? I, I think that right now, in the system we've got, in the facts that I have on the ground, that our plan works very well for our community. And more competition is, is, is good. But if, if we're just going to expand the market share of those who have an expanded share today, that's going to lead to less competition and a larger market share for those who already have, you know, over half the market share in Texas. And how, how does that, how is that healthy for competition? So I don't think it's competition when somebody's guaranteed a contract, number one. I think that's a false dichotomy to say that we're going to protect competition by preventing competition from occurring in the first place. Well, let's that's say, not competition. But, but I don't 
think based on how Medicaid managed care has grown and the dollars that are at stake, Representative, I just, and you've got Chairman Frank standing behind you. He may, he may agree with you or disagree with you. I don't know. But my guess I is he disagrees with me, I but go ahead. I cannot fathom, based on the amount of dollars that we are putting into Medicaid managed care, that every plan that is capable of delivering those services isn't highly motivated to submit an RFP and get a contract. The gentleman's time has expired. The, the following amendment, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment by Gonzales Del Paso. The chair recognizes Mrs. Gonzalez of El Paso to explain the amendment. Members, I know this is probably a very um, potentially confusing piece of legislation, but let me be very clear. We are, this piece of legislation impacts primarily Bear, El Paso, Harris, and Dallas counties. The impact of this piece of legislation puts at risk our local hospital districts. If you are not in those hospital districts, this primarily will not affect you, but your vote today will affect my community. Your vote today could put at risk 110 million federal dollars to my hospital district, which is 11% of our budget. I'm very concerned that a lot of us aren't paying attention to the impact of the bill and the potential that it could do to these communities that we are just trying to make sure have sustainable health care, that our hospital districts still get to do their work. If you are not in this, we are begging, asking for you to not hurt our hospital districts. And please, please if, stay with us because th this is an imp impact to y'all, but it does impact us. It does put us at risk. It does allow us for us to lose 11% of our hospital district's operating budget. This does have a negative impact. So this amendment simply exempts the hospital districts that are going to be impacted. El Paso, Bear, Harris, Dallas. Our delegations are asking for you to please not let our hospital districts be at risk in this moment in time. I move passage. Mr. Frank, for what purpose? Mr. Speaker, does the gentlelady yield? Yes, does sir. The author, she yields for questions. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Representative. So uh, obviously this does completely gut the bill. So if, if your hospital district, which currently has a insurance company that is handling the Medicaid patients in your area. They are doing a great job right now, are they not? Yes. Okay, they're, they're doing a great job, and so they do not need a mandatory contract given to them regardless. So under your amendment, if this were to pass and become law, if your hospital district does a horrible job, if your hospital MCO does a horrible job handling Medicaid patients, what would happen to them? Nonprofits would compete. No, that, no, because they're not. They're actually not competing because if they are given a mandatory contract, no matter how bad they perform to your constituents, I understand your hospital district wants to be guaranteed this book of business. These constituents that you have, your hospital district wants to be guaranteed their Medicaid lives. But I'm asking if they perform poorly. If they perform poorly, if they're the lowest ranking, if they're absolutely the worst and they're doing a terrible job, the state of Texas under current law has to give them a contract no matter how bad. And that's the same for Dallas. That's the same for Houston. It, this is not about protecting your hospital district. This is about protecting your people. Chairman Frank, I think that there was potentially a reasonable place to meet in the middle to create some guardrails. However, this bill does not do this. This bill just repeals what is currently what is currently the process and puts at risk a federal dollars and b interrupts the current the current uh, 
process for procurement. All, okay. I mean, all, they, they still have to submit an RFP. We still get to hold them accountable. But here's what I will say. Yep. If the majority of people who are being impacted by this bill are saying, we do not want this, at what point do we go to our colleagues and say, hey, we'll, we, we, I, I understand. Do you think that any member standing up here wants their constituents to get bad health care? No. I, 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 think I, that I, do, I, don't, I know that no one up there wants that. But when you only listen to your hospital and are not listening to the Medicaid patients, that is I don't think that's impact. fair because if you look at the respondents of surveys from the patients themselves, a lot of them do rank the, the do rank these folks in a, a really highly, especially in El Paso. And so I'm, I just really think it's important. Look, if, if the bill author came with, to the table with um, a piece of legislation that was nuanced and said, hey, let's do a preference. Let's do this, but that's not the bill on the floor today. The bill on the floor today is a complete repeal, which has potential for a domino effect of negative impact, particularly in these counties. And I think if there was a balanced bill, we wouldn't be fighting this hard. But we're yeah. fighting this hard because our hospital districts have an obligation and do and have to serve our communities. And when we put them at risk, we put the whole healthcare system for these hospital districts at risk. And and I, 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 I do agree, and I actually I have, I have been in discussions, we were looking at some preference language that I would like to see in there, because I actually I, I, I think most of these hospitals do a phenomenal job. Of the, four, of the four MCOs, I think three of them do a phenomenal job in taking care of it. And frankly, those three wouldn't be at risk at all, even if this goes through. I, I, would, like, I would like to just clarify, and I think I can do it on the back mic, there is no federal funds at risk. That is a total... I've got, I've got we, had, we had the testimony, I had the hospital CEOs, those hospitals are gonna draw down federal funds with or without being allowed to be in the insurance business. No, I, I think that the hospitals can draw down the funds, but some of the, ho the funds are tied to directly some of these, um, these, these, these plans and they are non-transferable. And I think that's where the confusion might be. I, I agree that the hospitals still get their hospital funds, but the plans do get some funds that are non-transferable. But I do think, okay. I, and I think this is why it's so critical. Members, there's lots of misinformation about this, what's happening right now, yes, and we have to make a decision on millions of people's health care. Millions of people's health care, and so don't make this decision lightly. Do, if you don't know how to vote, then don't vote, because you are literally going to potentially impact our hospital districts. And uh, yeah, going I, on to misinformation, um, Chairman Frank, who yeah. you know I respect and love so much, it is competitive. There are three entities that can still, those are wholly owned and operated by the hospital district, was created by a qualifying nonprofit corporation, or holds a certificate of authority as a health maintenance organization under certain conditions. I think to say there is no competition isn't completely accurate either. So again, well, there, we're all dealing with lots of different variances of facts I, in this conversation. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm not suggesting there's zero competition, but when you have a mandatory contract, by definition you don't. I'm going to close since we're just having an open debate. I, I actually love the idea of a preference. I absolutely think a mandatory contract for anyone is a terrible policy, but I appreciate I appreciate what you're doing, and I do, I do hope we can work towards a preference of some type. And, and Chairman Frank, if that, if that was a bill, a preference, I promise you it wouldn't be standing right here. But this is the most e extreme version, like, so, sorry, Chairman, this is the most extreme version, and I'm just trying to say, if we could come to the middle where we didn't put hospital districts at risk, again, different conversation, but we're not having that conversation today. Thank you. I move passage. Move adoption. The chair recognizes Mr. Martinez Fisher in favor of the amendment. <laughs> Members, please take your conversations outside the rail. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, look, I'm going to be real brief. Let's just, a lot of chatter. We're distracted. This is a third reading amendment. This is 100 votes. Now, you reflect and determine when is the last time you have been in front of a third reading amendment with this many people behind here, all saying it is about our local health care providers in our districts, not Chairman Frank's district, our districts. This amendment is for our districts, not Chairman Frank's district. We need this vote for two things. Number one, we need it to go on to protect our constituents. And number two, if it does go on and folks want to talk about how to artfully fix this thing, if you're looking for a reason to say, why should we help you? There are folks that have gone all the way through this process they have been awarded a contract. 
they are just not operating. And what we're doing is we're changing the rules. And if they say, you're not operating by September 1, too bad, start all over. And maybe for these business folks, that's enough. What about the patients? What are they going to do while we're going through this procurement? What kind of message are we sending them? Who are we really hurting? Give us the green light to get this on so that we can fix it. And don't take my word for it. Take everybody's word for it. I hope you vote for the amendment. Mr. Dutton, for purpose. Oh, I wanted to ask the author of the amendment a question. The chair recognizes Ms. Gonzalo of El Paso to close on the amendment. Mr. Dutton, for what purpose? Uh, would the gentlelady yield? Would the gentlelady yield for questions? Always for the chairman. She yields. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm really trying to be sure what your amendment actually does. Can you tell me that again? I'll read it and then I'll explain it. The I, amendment I can't says, hear you. I couldn't understand I, it. I, I'll read it and then I'll explain it. Okay. The amendment reads, the section only applies to a contract for a region with a population of 8,500,000 8, people or more. Basically, it exempts the, the hospital districts that are being impacted. El Paso, Harris, Bear, Dallas. And they're, they're Im impacted negatively by the bill. Yes, sir. And, and, and your amendment takes that away? Yes, sir. Eliminates that? And how does it do that? It exempts um, that that's, it exempts them from this part of the bill being applicable. Okay. From the repeal being applicable. Oh, I see. I see. I see your amendment does. Okay. I think I'll wait and ask the author a question. Okay. Move passage. Ms. Gonzalez, Gonzalez of El Paso sends an amendment. The amendment is not acceptable to the author. A record vote has been requested. The clerk will ring the bell. Dr. Oliverson voting nay. Ms. Gonzalez of El Paso voting aye. Mr. Bryant voting aye. Mr. Patterson voting nay. Have all members voted. There being 69 ayes and 74 nays, the amendment fails to adopt. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Doorkeeper. Mr. Speaker, I have a messenger from the Senate at the door of the House. I admit the messenger. Mr. Speaker, I'm directed by the Senate to inform the House that the Senate has taken the following action. Thank you, sir. The chair recognizes Ms. Johnson of Dallas in opposition to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. This is a, I want to emphasize just how important this legislation is. Medicaid provides care for the most vulnerable people in this state. Our children, our pregnant mothers, our elderly, our disabled, and we have not done enough to help them. If we pass this bill, we're going to make it that much harder for the most vulnerable people in this state to get necessary medical care. We're also going to make it to where we have a monopoly of Medicaid providers. This bill, the difference is we have for-profit renderers and we have nonprofit providers. Parkland Health in Dallas, Texas provides nonprofit charitable Medicaid care for the Dallas County and the seven counties surrounding it. That is a big deal, nonprofit. They're not here to suck money out of Medicaid and provide it to shareholders. They are here to provide the maximum amount of care possible with the little amount of money that we give them for Medicaid in this state. And this population and our community needs it, and this bill is terrible policy for the state of Texas. Secondly, the other thing that this bill does is it takes a very unconstitutional approach to contracting in this state. The Texas Constitution takes a very clear stand on the interference of active procurements. No retroactive law impairing the obligation of contracts shall be made. No retroactive law. What this bill does, we have already started procurement processes. Requests for proposals have already gone out. Entities have made 
have invested significant sums of money for the procurements. The contract process is already ongoing. This bill will retroactively void all of that. And that is unconstitutional. And it, again, it is terrible policy for this body to enact. We can have conversations about Medicaid. We filed a lot of bills on Medicaid expansion. I have as well. But that's not what this is about. This bill will actually restrict care. We spent a lot of time talking about the need for mental health. Mental health care will be compromised if this bill passes. It goes against everything that we're talking about. And I urge you all to vote no. Thank you. Will the, Mr. Bryant, for what purpose? Will the, my colleague yield? Ms. Johnson of Dallas. All right. May I be recognized, Mr. Speaker? Is Ms. Gonzalez of El Paso on the floor of the House? The chair recognizes Ms. Gonzalez of El Paso in opposition to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, I kind of gave my speech already, but here's what I will say. Representative Julie Johnson was very accurate that this bill does put at risk some of our most vulnerable and needy uh, Texans. That th this bill um, has potential implications for our communities. There is a lot of misinformation, that there isn't competitions, that the performance reviews aren't good, all these things, but a, a lot of that is misinformation. If we had a bill that was more nuanced, that was more balanced, we could be okay with that. But this bill completely undermines our hospital districts and puts our constituents at risk. All we're asking is that we vote this bill down and say next session, let's all work together to create a more balanced piece of legislation. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Bryant in opposition to the bill. Members, uh just to restate the basics one more time, under this bill, the Health and Human Services Commission would no longer be required to contract with managed care organizations that are either a hospital district or a nonprofit or a health maintenance organization. All three of those groups compete for the right to do this business. They have not only succeeded, they have excelled at what they do. The Health and Human Services C Commission, if you go on their website, you will see their report cards for each metropolitan area. For Houston, El Paso, Beaumont, and San Antonio, which I have in my hands here, the nonprofit or the publicly owned hospital exceeds the performance of the other privately operated groups. There is a substantive reason for the law being the way it is. It's in the public interest, and as Ms. Johnson said, it's in the interest of the poorest and most vulnerable people in our population. We're simply asking to keep it that way. There's no reason to make a change. Look at the report cards. With regard to experience of care, staying healthy, or common chronic conditions, these entities succeed in every case the performance of the private hospitals. That's why the law is the way it is. I urge you to vote against the bill. The chair recognizes Mr. Martinez Fisher in opposition to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I won't add what I already said, but it, I was hoping we can get the amendment, and we didn't win that. We needed 100 votes, but we're within five votes of voting this bill down. And, and that's, a, that's a sad consequence, but an equally sad consequence are the number of jobs that will be lost in our communities because there is no guarantee when these contracts are out, you go back to the start, 
There's no guarantee that these employees are going to have a job. So we've got two issues. We have patients not knowing what their future is for their future health care. We have providers that could shift ownership and no guarantee that the people who are doing the work right now, and it's hard work, that they're even going to have a job. I've talked to a couple of you already who did not vote. I appreciate you being with us. We can vote this down. We can fix it and bring it back. But if we pass it, we can't do anything about it. So I ask that you vote against this. Just give us a chance to get this fixed. Thank you. The chair recognizes Dr. Oliverson to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. Um, appreciate the opportunity to lay this out before you. Uh, in my heart, at the end of the day, I just want every Texan in the Medicaid system to get the best quality care they can. And with that, I move passage. The question occurs on final passage of HB 2401. Strict enforcement has been requested. Members, please vote from your desk. The clerk will ring the bell. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? There being 64 hours, 71 days, HB 2401 fails to pass the engrossment to, third, uh, to final passage.